Hi, today we're going to be looking at a Vestax PMC07 Pro D Samurai DJ Mixer. It came out in around 2001, or at least that's the earliest mention I can find of it on archives of Vestax's old Flash-based website, which has this super cute little fader menu. It belongs to Callum from Seed Skate Shop in Aberdeen, who has very kindly lent it to me. Seed's an awesome skater-owned shop that sells a wide variety of hard and soft goods, and like all small businesses right now, could really use some extra business, so check out their website and buy lots of stuff from them. I wanted to take a look at this mixer after my good friend DJ Backtrack sent me some photos of the internals of his samurai, and I decided it looked too interesting not to investigate. Anyway, Vestax were an enormously venerated name in the DJ scene, particularly by turntablists, as they were arguably the first company to properly embrace scratching and beat juggling, and they released some of the most iconic DJ mixers and turntables of all time. They also weren't afraid to experiment with oddball products, even when the exact target market for these products wasn't even apparent to their own staff. They sadly no longer exist, having closed their doors in 2014. This particular model is based on the standard PMC-07 Pro, which came out in 1997 and was Vestax's flagship battle mixer for over five years. Years. It can be seen in hundreds of classic DJ battles in what was truly a golden age of turntablism. This Samurai variant, however, boasts Vestax's digital crossfader technology. The technology was somewhat controversial at the time, with reviews complaining that the mixer's audio had a harsh digital sounding quality to it, and some people even asserted that using one of these mixers was cheating. I know a lot of you probably don't care about the reverse engineering part of this and just want to know what mods you can do to make this mixer better, and spoiler alert, there are a lot of possibilities for this thing, so skip to blah 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 for details about that. But for the rest of you, let's get started by going into some background info. For the non-DJs in my audience, a crossfader is used to select which turntable you want to listen to. When the fader is at the left, you hear the left turntable, when it's at the right, you hear the right turntable, and when it's in the middle, you can hear both. Traditionally, moving the fader from one side to the other slowly will gradually fade from one turntable to the other, but turntablists, i.e. scratch DJs, prefer the other track to come in at full volume after moving the fader only a couple of millimetres, so they can get really fast, accurate cuts. So on virtually all scratch or battle mixers, there's a curve control to tell the mixer how sharp you want this fade to be. Anyway, traditional faders like the one in the standard PMC-07 are a type of potentiometer, which is a device that varies its electrical resistance based on the position of a moving part, or wiper. The wiper has some metal prongs which make contact with a carbon-based track on the stationary part of the fader. The resistance between the metal prongs of the wiper and either end of the carbon track will depend on how far along the track the prongs are. The mixer measures this resistance to determine how loud to make each turntable. This is a very effective design, but it's not without its problems. Firstly, there's a fair amount of friction between the wiper and the carbon track, and this will eventually result in the track wearing down and the audio starting to crackle and bleed. Dirt and dust can easily get into the track too, exacerbating this problem. Also, turntablists generally like their faders to move as smoothly as possible, and the friction obviously doesn't help with that. All that being said, potentiometer faders can still be made to be perfectly usable for even the most demanding turntablist, and many people prefer advanced potentiometer faders like the Eclectic Brakes Pro X feed to their contactless counterparts. The Samurai fader in this mixer, however, isn't a potentiometer, and uses a different technology entirely. It's of the class of faders known as contactless faders, which means that there is no physical contact between between the wiper and the position sensing circuitry. Contactless faders are therefore theoretically more durable and can have a smoother action than carbon track faders. There have been a number of different designs of contactless fader over the years. The first was the optical focus fader by the legendary DJ Focus, which was manufactured by Stanton and used in their range of scratch mixers. Other manufacturers quickly realised the value of contactless faders and came up with their own solutions. Some went with optical designs also, such as the very interesting Infinium fader used in the Rodex Scratchbox and Mackie D2 Pro, which I did a teardown of in another video which I'll link to below. Another popular choice for contactless fader technology is magnetism. Rain were, I think, the first company to utilise this in their TTM56. Pioneer's recent Magvel fader also uses this approach, and even Vestax did their own spin on the idea with their CFX2 fader that appeared in some of their final products. The InnoFader by Audio Innovate stands alone in using capacitive technology. It also has the distinction of being able to be installed in pretty much every mixer ever made, even allowing mixers with no curve control to be used for scratching. However, as we'll find out, the Samurai Fader, or CFX, is based on a completely different principle to the others, and I've wanted to investigate how it works for a number of years now. So without further ado, let's get started. On first inspection, the most obvious change the Samurai variant makes is the silver and red colour scheme. I'm not a particular fan of this look, having grown up on the classic Vestax black and gold scheme, but I know it has its fans. In fact, I know people who've bought broken Samurai mixers just to swap the red faceplate onto their standard 07. Another change is the lack of a crossfader curve control knob on the front. This function has been moved to this knob on the faceplate, and instead of being a fully analogue control, it's instead an 8-position digital switch, which is a bit strange. 
Even stranger is this curve pattern switch, which allows you to do a number of peculiar things to the curve function. The manual goes into detail about this. The first curve pattern setting is how you'd expect a typical mixer to behave, with the sharpest setting cutting at the very edge of the fader, and the softest setting fading in gradually. The second curve pattern starts off like the softest setting of the previous pattern, and turning up the curve basically makes it sharp at the other end, cutting the sound in only when the fader is at the extreme far end, and having the mixer completely silent in the middle. The third curve pattern is like a combination of the first two patterns, going from sharp at one end to linear in the middle, then sharp at the other end. This is kind of similar to how the line fader controls work. But the real quote-unquote innovation of this mixer is the fourth curve pattern, which cuts the sound in and out several times over the course of the fader travel. The different curve modes specify the number of cuts and the width of each cut, ranging from 3 all the way up to 6 at the extreme setting. I suppose this mode was intended to be used by beginner DJs, as it allows them to cut the sound very quickly without having to spend years learning proper fader control skills. Now, I remember a lot of DJs at the time being very offended by this feature, as they claimed it would give people unfair advantages in DJ battles or whatever, but the last time I checked, battles were judged by how sick your routine is, rather than the number of fader clicks you could do per second, although that might be an interesting competition to organise sometime. But in any case, these DJs needn't have worried, because the multiple cut feature was implemented in such a way that it wasn't particularly useful. You see, your typical scratch DJ will have a beat playing on one turntable, and be scratching on the other turntable. They'll operate the fader in such a way that it only cuts the sound out on the turntable they're scratching with. The multiple cut feature on the Samurai, however, cuts the beat out any time the sample is playing, which makes it pretty useless for the way most scratch DJs would like to use it. But who knows, maybe we can do something about that. Anyway, enough talk, let's get this damn thing open and do some indecent things to it. Four screws take the lower faceplate off, and now we can see all three faders. The two line faders are the standard Vestax PCV type, but the cross fader is the one I'm really interested in, and taking it out reveals a lovely screen printed red Vestax logo. Let's have a look inside it to see if there are any clues about how it works. And isn't that a hell of a thing? There appear to be what looked like four air core inductors in a line. Compare that to a standard Vestax PCV cross fader, and you can see that this is a completely different sort of technology. But we'll go more into that later. Let's keep tearing this mixer down and see what other weird stuff we can find. Now, if you're familiar with the inside of a normal Vestax 07, this will all be very familiar to you. Nearly all of the circuitry is identical. I later removed all the boards and compared them to the ones in my 07, and there are virtually no changes. The board at the front that is missing the curve control knob even has space for that missing component, and has a couple of wire bridges to bypass this part of the circuit. The only major difference is this cable here, which in a normal 07 would go to the crossfader, instead goes to this additional circuit board mounted here. This circuit board in turn connects to the Samurai fader, as well as the two curve pattern controls on the top of the mixer. So the upshot of all this is that the Vestax 07 Samurai is just a standard Vestax 07, with some additional circuitry to convert the digital Samurai fader signals to standard analog fader signals. This of course all means that, contrary to what I believe for years, the Vestax Samurai mixers are actually analog mixers, not digital. It's therefore difficult to see how claims of them having a harsh digital sound could possibly be true, but we'll go into that later. I won't go into detail about the analog circuitry, because that's nothing really new, but I have some details on my website that I'll link to below. For now though, let's take a deep dive into the digital digital fader circuitry. We'll start by probing the output of the converter board. As you can see, as I move the fader from end to end, we get an analog voltage between 0 and 5 volts, which is exactly what we'd get from a standard carbon track fader like the original. So as we surmised earlier, this board is pretending to be a standard fader. So let's remove the converter board and have a look. The first thing I noticed was the sheer amount of circuitry on this thing. There's 8 digital logic chips, a 40 pin daughter board module containing god knows what, a hybrid module in the power supply section, and even a memory chip, in this case a 128 kilobyte ROM. I just know that this is going to be super fun to reverse engineer, so let's get to it. But let's start with the fader itself. First we need to dismantle the mechanism, which we can do by removing the two circlips holding in the rails. These are known in the industry as Jesus clips, because they have a tendency to violently fly off when you remove them and cause the repair tech to blaspheme in surprise. If this happened, there's no way I'd ever find them in my appallingly untidy workshop, so I put some electrical tape over them to stop that. Instead of metal prongs like on a normal fader, the wiper instead has this metal plate attached to it. The manual for this mixer claims that this is a permanent magnet, but that doesn't seem to be true, I couldn't get any metal to stick to it. The manual also mentions the inductor coils we saw earlier, which are attached to this little circuit board. I traced out the circuit board schematic, and it's super simple. There's one pin wired to each inductor coil, and a couple of common pins wired to all the coils in parallel through resistors. The fader PCB mentions that it's manufactured by a company called Amitech, which, according to their website, specialises in high-precision industrial sensor technology. 
Their particular focus seems to be on inductive sensors, like the Samurai Fader appears to be. The website doesn't go into too much detail, but using Google's patent search engine finds a patent registered to Amitech that's very illuminating. Figure 9A on page 7 looks exactly like a longer version of the Samurai Fader in that it has a number of coils in a row and a sliding metal section. In addition, figure 5 on page 5 is pretty much the exact circuit we traced out earlier. I think we've found what we're looking for. The text of the patent goes into a lot of detail about this, but I'll just give a quick summary. You see, each of these coils exhibits a physical property called inductance. There are lots of videos explaining inductance on the internet, so I won't go into it here, but the point is the inductance of each coil is a thing we can measure. I've hooked up my ultra-cheap inductance meter to the rightmost coil, and you can see it measures around 2.9 millihenries. Now, inductors typically have a metal core inside them, but these are air core inductors, which have no core at all and have significantly lower inductance than their metal core counterparts. But if we put a metal object right next to them, this will sort of act like the missing metal core and increase the inductance slightly. The Samurai Fader Wiper has a metal plate on its underside, and you can see as I move it over the rightmost coil, its inductance increases by about 0.3 of a millihenry. This happens with any ferrous metal object, not just the wiper. Actually, that gives me an idea. Anyway, this gives us our answer for how the fader works. The control circuitry measures the inductance of each coil, and by comparing their relative inductances it can tell exactly how far the wiper is along the fader travel. I believe the Eternal fader from Eckler is also based on inductive sensing, but it seems to work in a very different way. If anyone wants to lend me one to take a look at, please get in touch. So how exactly does the control circuit measure this inductance? Well, one feature of an inductor is that if you input an AC signal, i.e. a sine wave, the output will be shifted by an amount relative to its inductance, in a phenomenon known as phase shift. If we hook the fader back up to its control circuit and monitor the inputs and outputs with a scope, we can observe this effect. The top pink wave is the input signal, and the lower yellow and blue waves are the outputs from the leftmost two coils. You can see that as I move the wiper between the two coils, the output waves shift slightly relative to the input wave and each other. The number at the bottom of the screen is the phase angle relationship between the two output waves, and you can see how it switches from positive to negative as I move the wiper from one coil to the other. So that explains how the control circuit works. It compares the phase of each coil relative to its neighbour coil, and the phase angle tells it the exact position. This processing is all done on this little dotter board, which I desoldered to see if it had anything interesting on its underside. Unfortunately, it just had a single proprietary chip made by Amitech, but that's okay. We've pretty much already figured out how it works. So what's happening in the rest of the control circuit, and how does the weird curve selection feature work? Well that's another super interesting story. So once the daughter board module has figured out the fader position, it outputs it via these eight lines here. Each line is binary, so it can only be 1 or 0, and the combination of 8 lines means we can represent any number from 0 to 255. To verify this, I probed all 8 signals with this super cheap USB logic analyzer and had it display the output on my laptop. As you can see, as I move the fader from left to right, I get an increasing number on the screen. It doesn't quite cover the full range from 0 to 255 though, probably just because every unit is built slightly differently. In fact, after I disassembled and reassembled the fader, it reported a slightly different range of numbers. Anyway, this 8-bit digital fader position number number is then fed into this thing here, which is a ROM, or read-only memory chip. ROMs are a type of chip that can be programmed to store a big chunk of digital data, in this case 128 kilobyte. ROMs are often used to store software and graphics, like in, for example, retro video game cartridges, or audio samples, like in ROM-based samplers such as the Roland D50 or Korg M1. But in this case, the ROM is storing the various different fader curve patterns and translating the 8-bit digital fader position into another 6-bit number representing the audio volume. Exactly how the fader position gets translated into the audio volume depends on how you have the curve pattern knobs set up. I'll hook up the logic analyzer to the ROM's outputs so you can see what I mean. On the softest curve setting, the output volume pretty much rises proportionally with the position of the fader, up to its maximum of 63, which is the highest value you can represent with 6 binary bits. But on the sharpest curve setting, it suddenly jumps up to almost its full value after only a few millimetres of travel. On the weird multi-cut patterns, it jumps about all over the place, as you'd expect. So let's see what's on this ROM. I carefully removed it from its socket and dumped the contents using my super cheap USB ROM tool, and looking at the contents in a hex editor we can see that there do appear to be what look like fader patterns. But to get a better look at these patterns, I imported it into my favourite ROM programming tool, Microsoft Excel, or actually Google Sheets in this case. I set it up to draw different shades of grey depending on the volume level. You can see at the top of the first pattern is the sharpest setting as it goes to white pretty quickly, and at the bottom is the softest setting as it's more gradual. 
The other patterns look how you'd expect too, with the weird multi-cut setting at the bottom, which looks suspiciously like the Arecibo Space Telescope message, but it actually corresponds exactly with the fader patterns shown in the Samurai Manual. The exact same patterns are stored elsewhere in the ROM, but back to front. This is because the second mixer channel obviously has to behave in an opposite fashion to the first, because it cuts in at the other side of the fader. I'll link you to a PDF of these patterns if you want to look at them, or even frame them and put them on your wall like I did as a reminder of how much time I wasted on this ridiculous project. So the last piece of the puzzle is how it turns the single 6-bit digital digital value coming out of the ROM into two analogue values, one for each channel of the mixer. For this you'd think it would need 12 signals, 6 for each channel, but this ROM only has 8 address lines, two of which aren't even hooked up to anything. So how's it doing this? Well it's using these two chips here. These are known as latches or flip-flops, and what they do is temporarily store the 6-bit value coming out of the ROM so it can be converted to an analogue signal. There's one latch for each mixer channel, and the ROM switches back and forward between the two latches very quickly, nearly 20,000 times a second. This basically means that they've doubled the available output lines of the ROM. The whole process is controlled by this chain of digital logic chips up here, and together they generate the control signals necessary to keep the fader, ROM and latches synchronised. It's the most complicated part of the entire circuit, and the video is getting too long already so I won't go into it here, but here's the details up on screen so those of you who care can pause and look at it. The 6-bit digital values are converted to analogue by a device called an R2R ladder, which is just a simple resistor network and is pretty much the most simple type of analogue to digital converter you can get. These analogue values are then filtered by these capacitors, buffered by this operational amplifier, and finally output via this connector here, which connects to the rest of the mixer's analogue circuitry, just like a normal carbon track fader would. To my eyes, this whole control circuit seems a bit old-fashioned. Even in 2001, it would have been possible to simplify the design from nearly a dozen chips down to a single microcontroller that could have read the phase angle from the coils directly and driven the analogue outputs using PWM. But that's the reality of manufacturing. Engineer hours are often more expensive than components, and Vestax probably cobbled this circuit together from designs they made years before when microcontrollers were primitive and expensive. So that's pretty much it for our reverse engineering adventure. I now have to get this thing repaired and serviced so it can go back to its owner, and we'll also look at some modifications we could make. Before you do any of these things to your own mixer, however, check the video description for any updates and corrections that I might have made after I uploaded this video. Firstly, the mixer has a dodgy power input. This seems to be a common problem with 07s, as I actually had to fix the exact same thing on my 07 last week. It's really easy to fix though, the problem is just cracked solder joints, so flowing some fresh solder onto them fixes it right up. The next thing we should really do is adjust the output levels. The optocouplers in these mixers tend to drift over time, and as a result the relative volumes of each channel are way off. You do that with these four tiny pots here that you can turn with a screwdriver. It takes some trial and error, but by running a test tone through it and looking at the output in, for example, a DAW, you can get the levels nice and even again. Now we'll clean and lubricate the faders as they're really gummed up. Most scratch DJs are very used to doing this, but I thought I'd share my method which always worked great for me. First, completely dismantle the fader, including in this case the metal plate on the wiper section. Next, wash all the components thoroughly with warm water and a tiny drop of dish soap, using a toothbrush to get into all the nooks and crannies of the wiper, and maybe even running a rolled up paper towel through the hard to reach inner parts of the holes. Then after rinsing everything off with some more water, clean it all again with some isopropyl alcohol, again using a toothbrush and a rolled up paper towel. This will get everything absolutely squeaky clean. Once everything is dried, reassemble the fader and lubricate the rails with KEG F5 or F100. Note that the Samurai fader seems to be very sensitive to over lubrication, so take it easy. You should do this with the line faders too, although they're a bit more tricky since you have to bend parts of the enclosure to get the rails out. Another thing you could do is replace the fader with a completely different one. Since this is a standard Vestax 07, you can wire any Vestax compatible fader in by modifying the connector slightly. I explain how to do this with an Inno fader in another video, which I'll link you to, and this approach will also work with other faders like the Pro X fade. This will however disable all the digital fader circuitry including the pattern controls, and as a result you won't be able to do any of the other mods mentioned later in this video. But anyway, now we have a nice buttery fader installed, let's see what else we can do. One thing I've noticed about the Samurai mixer is that the fader has a large amount of decay or fade out when cutting the audio. This means that the audio takes around 60 milliseconds to completely cut out after you close the fader. This gives your cuts a weird nasty soft sound, especially when doing crabs and three click flares etc. The culprits are these two 100 nanofarad capacitors on the fader control board, namely C18 and C30. If you remove these capacitors and optionally replace them with a smaller value, maybe 1 to 30 nanofarads, the decay gets shortened significantly and this makes a massive improvement to the overall feel when cutting. It's like using a whole new mixer. This is probably the single biggest thing you can do to improve the Samurai as a scratch mixer. Now the value of capacitor you need is going to depend on your mixer, as there were three different variants of the Samurai, the 05, the 06 and the 07. Too small a capacitor and you might get a nasty popping noise every time you cut the sound. Too large a capacitor and your cuts won't be sharp enough. 
I find it was okay to remove the capacitors entirely on the 07, as it's based on optocoupler technology, which has an inherent slight decay anyway. This worked perfectly fine, but I ended up adding a 1 nanofarad capacitor back on, as there was a very, very slight click when cutting low frequency audio below about 100Hz. If this doesn't bother you, just desolder or snip the capacitors off the board and forget about replacing them. The 05 and 06 are both based on JFET technology, which has much less inherent decay and will likely require larger capacitors. If you want to try this, get a few different capacitors, maybe start at 10 nanofarads and go up or down from there depending on how it feels and sounds. But the mod I'm most excited to tell you about involves the ROM chip. You see, not only can the USB ROM tool I mentioned earlier read the patterns off the ROM chip, it can write entirely new ones to the chip, or in my case a completely different chip because I want to leave the original one how it is. This means that we can replace the completely useless patterns on the original ROM with something way more useful. Now we could go through the ROM with a hex editor and program everything in manually, but that would be a bit fiddly and I think it helps to have something to visualise the patterns as you're editing them, so I made a Google Sheets document for this exact purpose. The horizontal axis represents the different fader positions, and the vertical axis represents the different curve pattern selection switch combinations. To use it, you edit each fader position with a value from 0 to 63, where 0 is silence and 63 is full volume. Then, once you're happy with how everything is set up, hit the menu marked Funky Stuff and click Convert to Binary. It will then dump a file called Samurai.bin in your Google Drive, which can be downloaded to your computer and programmed straight to any 32-pin, 1-megabit programmable ROM. I recommend electrically erasable ROMs like the W20 C010 because you don't need to have a UV lamp to erase them if you mess up the programming. Using these tools I built a couple of custom ROMs that should be more useful to turntablists than the standard one. I call the first one Ronin thanks to PowerThesaurus.org for the name, because a Ronin is apparently a samurai without a master, seems appropriate. The Ronin ROM gets rid of any soft curves and fancy patterns entirely, and locks the fader curve into being razor sharp at all times, even sharper than the sharpest setting in the original ROM. Now, instead of choosing the curve or pattern, the two pattern knobs instead adjust the cut-in position of the fader. This is also known as lag. The curve pattern knob adjusts the lag on the left side of the fader, and settings 1 through 4 of the CF fine knob adjust the lag on the right side. Using these controls it's possible to get the cut-in down to fractions of a millimetre, making the Samurai fader easily as good as anything modern mixers have to offer. There are four possible settings for the lag at each side, and I imagine different mixers will require different settings. In fact, each time I disassembled and reassembled the fader I found I had to tweak this setting slightly. But that's not all. Positions 5 through 8 of the CF fine knob also also adjust the lag on the right hand side, but additionally enable a U-shaped fader curve, meaning the audio cuts out at both sides of the fader. This is similar to how a lot of portable scratch turntables are set up, and it's really useful if you're hanging with DJs who scratch with a crossfader reversed, as I do, and you don't want to keep flipping the hamster switch. Also I know of at least one DJ who cuts on both sides of the fader, namely DJ Tiger style, so I suppose this would be useful to him too. I have another alternative firmware, which I'm tentatively calling Bushy, that takes the multi-cut pattern concept of the original ROM and tries to do something a bit more useful with it. It's mostly similar to the Ronin firmware, but instead of having four positions on the left side of the fader, it only has three. The fourth position on the curve pattern knob instead puts the mixer into the multi-cut mode as with the original ROM. But instead of cutting between both channels, it instead only cuts one channel in at a time, so you can cut over beats and not have them cut out every time your sample cuts in. Also I've changed the patterns to one that I believe would be much more useful to turntablists than in the OG ROM. There's a setting for one-click orbits or chirps, a setting for two-click orbits or boomerangs, a setting for three-click orbits or swing flares, a couple of different transform patterns, two crescent flare options, one on each side of the fader, and finally one that spells out SOS and Morse code, which I suppose would be useful if the DJ booth catches fire and you need to call for help. Personally, I'm going to stick with the Ronin firmware, since I've never been convinced that the concept of fader patterns was ever a good idea to start with, but at least they're now implemented in a way that somewhat makes sense. On Callum's mixer, what I actually ended up doing was using the unused space in the ROM to store the OG, Ronin and Bushy patterns all to the same chip, soldered some wires to the unused address pins of the ROM, then added some switches underneath the faceplate to change between them. If you want to know more about that, then hit me up for details. I'll give you links to both firmwares in the video description, and you'll need a ROM programmer such as the TL-866 to program them. I wasn't planning on starting up a Tindy store or something selling pre-programmed ROMs, but if you want I'll sell you one for 20 quid or something, just get in touch. Vestax rather considerately put the ROM in a socket so you don't even need to be able to solder to do this mod.
Well, I guess that's the end of our Samurai adventure. So what do I think of this mixer overall? Well, I've always had a soft spot for Vestax products, as they're what I learned to scratch on, and their willingness to release what really should have been experiments as finished products has always delighted me. This product is no exception. The design of the fader and control circuit is convoluted, but very interesting and surprisingly effective. And if it hadn't been for a few implementation details like the poorly thought out cut patterns and the fader decay, then it could have been the finest mixer of its era. I'm so glad we were able to finally realise its full potential nearly 20 years after it was first released. I didn't expect that this mixer would be so interesting to play with, and this has been a super fun video to do, so if you made it this far then thanks for watching. I'd like to give another shout out to Callum from Seed Skate Shop, visit his website, the link's in the video description. Also to my mate Scotty who hooked me up with him in the first place. Elliot from Audio Innovate who sent some innofaders over for testing, check the link in the video description for the instructions on how to fit that. DJ Focus who helped me understand the history of contactless faders. And of course DJ Backtrack, without whom I would have never thought to do this project in the first place. Backtrack has developed a range of amazing mods for various turntables including a MIDI mod for the Vestax PDX2000 and an Ultra Pitch mod for the Technics 1200 range, so I'll give you a link to his website below. He was also just an awesome dude to brainstorm ideas with for this video and other projects I've done, so thanks mate. If you liked this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, I'm always doing weird little projects like this, so something interesting might pop up, you never know. Bye bye.